It's good to see everyone here this, on this beautiful Sunday morning. Welcome to our services. Let's start out by turning to page 56. Start our service off page 56. To God be to the glory as we all stand. Page 56. I know that's important, so. Anyway, good morning, East Bristol. Great to see you guys. Going to be a warm week, you know. My wife and I couldn't wait to go to bed last night, cut the AC on. We typically cut the AC on at night, you know, when the bedtime, we're just kind of frugal. Went upstairs, and it didn't work. <laughs> AC was broken, so. It's always great to be in the house of the Lord. Amen? But it's especially great when we have air conditioning. So I want to praise God for that. Woo! I do praise Him. It's good to see everybody. Um, I do want to say, uh, your, your deacons and I are working on kind of some things we can do in the near future to maybe get some things changed in the church. So I just want you all to know we are working on some things and hopefully here soon we're going to be presenting to you all and uh, we're hoping for maybe the next business meeting we can present some, some changes the church can make that maybe would send us in a different direction. And uh, again, I want to just ask you all as we go through this transition 
let's try some things and let's let's be loving and let's be cordial about it let's be christian like and if we don't like it we'll back up and punt and try something else so we're going to try some things but hopefully soon we'll be presenting those things to you so for your all's approval so i just i just, I just want you to know we are working on some things so um, you, your deacons are working hard, and I appreciate that. that. So uh, just just want to thank you. Got, got a lot to do, and really got a lot to say in the sermon, so I don't want to re- waste any more time. But uh, it is good to see everyone here. So let's go to our Father in prayer. Heavenly Father, we do thank you for your mercies. Thank you for your grace. But most of all, Christ, uh, God, we thank you for your Son, Jesus Christ. And it's in Christ's name, Lord, I lift up this church, East Bristol. I lift up each one here their family. Lord, I pray that you bless them. And Lord, I just pray that the challenges that are facing us, not only in our culture, but uh, Lord, just as we, as we try to be the church, you would have us to be, Lord, that you would give us grace. You would consider us to show love on us, Lord, but you would, Lord, make us a mighty force in our community and in our township so that we can spread the gospel. Lord, we do ask you for all these things, And we thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. And this morning for our mission moment will be Miss Betty Bailey. Our missionary for the week is Matt and Amanda Haddon from South Dakota. Matt Haddon planned to become an international missionary before he visited the Pine Ridge Reservation in, <clears throat> excuse me, in South Dakota on a short-term mission trip. While there, he saw the tremendous need around him. Matt realized. God was calling him and his family to serve the people there long term. Less than 3% of the Ogala Latata people claim to know Jesus. Matt and his wife Amanda hope to change these statistics and help them experience the hope of the gospel. The Haddon's led Chuck Ranch, a Send Relief Ministry Center on the reservations. They share Christ through a three-pronged approach, a summer camp, providing free home repair, and offering medical services through a new clinic. The cooperative program takes the gospel to the nations and the neighborhoods. Your financial support through the cooperative program helps missionaries and church plants be intentional in a gospel reach to their communities. Pray the Lord would give the Haddon's wisdom as they minister to the many physical and spiritual needs of the Ogala Latato people. And our passage today is Luke 7, 44. And he turned to the woman and said unto Simon, See if thou this woman, I entered into thy house. Thou gavest me no water for my feet, but she hath washed my feet with tears and wiped them with the hair of her head. The, thou givest me no kiss, but this woman, since the time I came in, hath not a Cease to kiss my feet, my head with oil, my head with oil thou didst not anoint, but this woman hath anointed my feet with thorns. Wherefore I say unto thee, her sins, which are many, are forgiven, for she hath much, for she loved much, but to those little is forgiven. 
the same love little. And he said unto her, Thy sins are forgiven. <laughs> Thank you, Miss Betty. Uh, before we do announcements, I would have to, like to say uh, Happy Father's Day uh, to everyone. Uh, announcements for this week, the pastor will be in his office, just letting you know, Monday through Thursday from 9 a.m. to 3 p.m., and his mobile number is on the front of the bulletin if you need to get a hold of him at any time. Uh, Children's Church ages K through 4th grade will meet upstairs during the service. Bulletins and prayer lists are on the tables at both entrances. Offering counters for the month of June is Frank Lambert and myself. WMU will meet tomorrow, June the 17th at 11 a.m. And please remember to give to the Shoebox Ministry. Uh, we're asking that you give money this year and uh, put it in a plan or a giving envelope and mark for it shoeboxes. And uh, Beverly and Sharon, thank you for that. And as well as the whole church, thank you for that mission. Uh, thank you for assisting with the, helping us uh, make sure all the lights are off at the end of services and checking make sure the outside doors are locked god bless each and every one of you and there will be a luncheon to welcome our new pastor and family sunday june 23rd next sunday after the service we would like for you to bring either a vegetable and meat two vegetables or a meat and vegetables desserts will be provided salads are included as a vegetable uh, beverly will put a list for you to sign and put on what you're bringing i would assume it's in the back okay We'll try, to, we'll try to get that. Well, you need it today, don't we? Maybe we ought to put another one on there. And uh, also, uh, not on in the bulletin, uh, we uh, have a gift for all the men today when you leave, so uh, make sure you go out that door so you can receive your gift. All right, let's continue on. We do have a change uh, for our fellowship hymn will be 344. Our fellowship hymn today will be 344 as we all stand to sing Grace Greater Than Our Sin.
All right, as we're heading back, um, Sharon has made us a new list to sign up for the meal next week. So if you signed up last week, please sign up again. Uh, that way we don't kind of get mixed up. All right, for a special music uh, this morning, let's turn to page 416. As we all stand, 416, we're marching to Zion. Okay, good deal. All right, well, we're going to be starting in the book of Exodus today. Well, let me back up. Uh, we begin a series on the book of Exodus, but to go through, to start Exodus, we must have an understanding of Genesis. So I'm going to quickly review Genesis so that we can have an understanding of exactly what's going on in Exodus. So uh, again, we've got a lot to go over, so I do not want to waste any time. And so we will begin. I love Exodus. It's one of my favorite books. You'll find out my favorite book is always the one I'm preaching through or teaching through. I mean, I can't help it. They're just, they're, they are just unbelievable to me. But truly, my, 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 my three favorite books are the Gospel of John, the, the Book of Acts, which we're going through on Wednesday night. I want to encourage you all, if you're able to come Wednesday night, we go through the Book of Acts, and Exodus. Now, the greatest of all time is, is Romans. I mean, that's undisputed. I mean, most any good God-fearing Christian will tell you Romans is, in fact, the greatest book in the Bible. Paul has done a 
brilliant job at detailing what exactly is the gospel and how we attain salvation. So does it beautifully. It's even studied now in secular schools because his writing and argument is just so phenomenal. So, uh, so book of Romans is just is just amazing. But I do love John, Acts, and Exodus. So, uh, but really, you've got to you've got to begin at Genesis to get that understanding. So we have a lot of ground to cover. So I'm going to have to ask you again, which I do often. Listen quickly, keep up, take notes, take take notes. This is this is some good stuff. Okay. So uh, if you're willing and able, would you please stand for the reading of God's Word? The grass wither, the flower fade, but the Word of our God shall stand forever. Amen to that. I'm going to start in Genesis, the last chapter of Genesis. And Jerry, I told you wrong, it's the last ten chapters of Genesis, starting with verse 14. And Joseph, you remember Joseph, the son of Jacob, and Joseph returned into Egypt he and his brethren, and all that went up with him to bury his father after he had buried his father. And when Joseph's brethren saw, so Joseph's brother saw that their father was dead, they said, Joseph will, will peradventure us. Does anybody know what that means? Potentially. It means potentially hate us, meaning he's going to have some hard feelings because of how we treated him, and now that dad's gone, uh-oh, and will certainly requit, requit, which is pay us all evil which we did unto him. Remember the, 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 the brothers threw him in the pit and sold him in slavery? So they're now afraid, of, hey, dad's dead, and we're afraid of what Joseph's going to do. In verse 16, and they sent a messenger unto Joseph, saying, Thy father did command before he died, saying, So shall ye say unto Joseph, Forgive and pray thee now the trespass of thy brethren and their sin. For they did evil, for they did unto thee evil, and now we pray thee, Forgive the trespasses of the servants of God of thy father. And Joseph wept when they spake unto him. And his brethren also went and fell down before his face. And they said, Behold, we be thy servants. So they're bowing down to Joseph. Remember his dreams? Think about that. But, but as for you, ye thought evil against me. But God meant it for good to bring to pass as it is this day to save much people alive. Now therefore fear ye not, I will nurse you I will, and your little ones and he comforted them, so Joseph was taken care, and spake kindly unto them. Verse 22, And Joseph dwelt in Egypt, he and his father's house, and Joseph lived a hundred and ten years. And Joseph saw Ephraim's children of the, of the third generation, the children also of Micah, the son of Manasseh, were brought up upon Joseph's knee. And Joseph said unto his brethren, I die and God will surely visit you and bring you out of this land, Egypt, and into the land which he swore to Abraham and Isaac and Jacob. And Joseph took an oath of the children of Israel, saying, God will surely visit you. He will carry you up, my bones from hence. So Joseph died, being 110 years old, and they embalmed him and put him in a coffin. This is God's word for God's people. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we do thank you for the inerrant and fallible word, and Lord, I just pray our hearts would be open this morning, and that your word would fall on fertile soil, Lord, so that it may grow abundantly in our hearts, so that we would be on fire for the mission of Jesus Christ, and it's in his name I pray, amen. You may be seated. So Genesis is basically, it's real simple, Genesis is broken all up into two kind of segments. You have Genesis 1 through 11, and then you have Genesis 12 through 50. So if you're familiar with Genesis, you know that chapters 1 through 11, and if you've ever heard Ken Ham and his sermon on Genesis 1 through 11, great sermon, YouTube it, Google Ken Ham, Genesis 1 through 11. He does a phenomenal job at explaining that. But that is God dealing with man, dealing with man, and man continually, continually messing up. But God is faithful. 
and God is a forgiving God. So, uh, so we have Genesis 1 through 11, so it's God in the world, and then we have Genesis 12 through 50, which is God and a family. So let's quickly begin with Genesis 1 in the beginning. <laughs> well, I promise we'll get through this quickly. So Genesis 1.23 says, God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him male and female, created he them. So why does God make them male and female? Because uh, they are meant to be joined. So where, where, does, where does woman come from? The rib of a man. Now think about this, guys. Think about this. What happens when you marry? You get that rib back. You become one flesh in marriage. My wife and I are one. So that is why, and I know, I know it's, a, it's an issue in the, in, in the church as well. That's why divorce is so horrible, because it tears. You cannot separate two without there being damage. You just can't do it, because God created woman from man so that when they marry, they become one again. So that's very important. That's designed by God. And marriage is very intimate, is it not? It's intimate. So is our relationship with God. Our God, should ha- we should have an intimate relationship with God. You should go to Him daily and, and praise Him for His glory, His awesomeness, but also thank Him for His forgiveness for all the things you've done that day or that week. Or, you know, that, we should have an intimate relationship with God just like we have with our spouse. We really should. So... God made them to be joined together again so that they could have that relationship. So that, and that is really a picture of our relationship with the Father. So, so God made them in the image. Now, I've told you all before, and, and I'll, I'll be strong about this, bold. Um, that, is why, uh, <laughs> that is why children are image bearers of God, and they deserve equal protection. So I don't care if you're a six-month-old child or in the womb in six months. You deserve a chance. You deserve all the rights of someone who is six months old versus, well, six, you know, six months outside the womb or six months inside the womb. You're a human being from conception. Okay? Y'all understand that? We should outlaw abortion, period. Now, I'm going to get a little bit touchy here. If you've got an issue with it, come see me later. I, I, I'm sick and tired of a what about rape? What about rape? We do not punish the child for the crimes of the father. Now, you know, that's, that's my stance because it's biblical. We do not punish the child because of the crime. Now, What should happen to the rapist? He should die. Woo, I thought you said value life, Peter. No, no, it's biblical. Because God has in his laws clearly, when man violates certain laws, he is to be stoned to death. Now, I know in America we think differently, and, you know, I want to be a law-abiding citizen, but the truth of the matter is, if rapists should be handled severely, severely, So we value life because all image bearers of God, but, you know, you have to be accountable for your life as well. So when if you go around murdering and doing things that are, you know, God, the book says you must die. I mean, eye for an eye, that's for that country. And I know we give grace and all that, so don't, you know, I know what all that means, but I'm just saying, you know, God shows us there that life is valuable, but also, you know, justice is, is just as important. Justice is just as important. So, anyway, I hope I didn't offend anybody. So, but, but in, in the beginning, Genesis 1, Genesis 2, the earth is an awesome place. I mean, the earth, I mean, think about it. You have got paradise, Eden. You got all the food you can handle. You got, you, you really got your spouse and y'all were running around naked. I mean, come on, guys. I mean, how awesome is that? 
all the food, it's just, it's incredible. But then what happens? What happens? Sin. The serpent comes in in Genesis 3. And you know what he says? Did God really say? See, that's what all, all cults will tell you. Is that really what it says? Ah, that's not what it really says. Yes, it is. What happened in Matthew chapter 4? Well, really in all the Gospels. When Jesus Christ was baptized and went into the wilderness 40 days, fasted, not eating, very malnourished, you know, very weak, who came and tempted him? Satan. And how did he tempt Jesus? By twisting God's word. Hey, look at all this you can have, Jesus. Bow down to me. And, what is Je and Jesus always quotes Scripture back. The Bible says, what well, Jesus doesn't say, the Bible, the Scripture says, worship God and God only. So even in his weakest moment, can you imagine not eating or drinking for 40 days? The devil thought he had him. But God held, I mean, Jesus held on to Scripture. And so, and so the devil could not, could not tempt him. So, but I, I just want you to notice that. The beginning of the Old Testament, the Old Covenant, the devil shows up. The beginning of the New Covenant. Now think about this. Adam failed. Who is the second Adam or the greater Adam? Jesus Christ. He succeeded. He succeeded. Now, was Jesus plan B? Adam and Eve are plan A, and Jesus is plan B. Was Jesus plan B? Nope. Jesus was the plan from the beginning because God knew man's heart. Now, be honest. You would. Be honest. You're walking down the sidewalk, and there's a park bench that says, do not touch wet paint. What is your first inclination? Is that, is that wet now? We want to touch it, don't we? We do. Man hates to be told what to do. Stay off the grass. You take a few steps on the grass. I mean, you know, it's, it, it, there's that simple thing. Man doesn't like to be told what to do. It's our, it's our nature. We, don't, we, don't, we push back on that. But the law is clear in that regard. So God is good. So we have, in the beginning, God created beautifully everything. And we are made in the image of God. Horses are not made in the image of God. Dolphins, as smart as they are, are not made in the image of God. Gorillas and apes, as smart as they are, they are not made in the image of God. Challenge somebody and say, we came from gorillas. It's just, it's not true. Gorillas don't have hospitals and governments and militaries and interstates. They don't because they are not image bearers of God. We are. We are, and by nature, we want order. It's just so simple to see. So just keep that in mind. Evolution is a lie from the devil. It's a lie from the And I know our schools teach it, but I, I, I'm a firm believer in creation. I'm a firm believer in creation. I'm a little ahead of my notes, so. Okay, so Genesis 3, man falls. Man disobeys God and brings death. So Genesis 4, what happens? What happens in Genesis 4? Adam and Eve have children, Cain and Abel. And what does Cain do? Kills his brother. And what does God, God says, hey, Cain, wh wh where's your brother? And, and what does Cain say? Am I my brother's keeper? See, there is sin and contamination in the world. Man, for you to kill your brother, whew, you got, a, you got an anger issue. But you can see the world is all of a sudden so quickly falling into disrepair, to disarray, to selfishness. So that's happening. So Genesis 5 is, is really Adam's genealogy. You know, there's, I know we skipped the genealogy parts, but, you know, Adam, uh, Genesis 5 is, is the genealogy, and it ends with Noah. And then Genesis 6, and I'll grant you it is kind of a weird chapter, but Genesis is really just there to show you that man has gotten so depraved at this point that God says, I, I'm going to take one family and save them 
and destroy everything. Man, beast, everything, it's going to be destroyed. God is good. God, man is so evil, that's what God does. He separates Noah and his family. There's eight total. Noah builds an ark by faith and obedience, builds an ark, and they are saved. Takes two pair. We all know that story. So Genesis 6 through 9 is basically the story of the flood and how that goes and, 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 and you know, when the flood subsides. And then in Genesis 10, we read about, you know, uh, uh, Noah's three children. And remember Ham and, and Moses', is, uh, Moses is, Noah's, you know, drunkenness? There was shame. Ham brought shame by telling his two brothers. So, you know, Shem was also a brother. And, you know, from his line, we have the depravity that leads up to, the, to, to, to Babel, the Tower of Babel. Remember that? They, that, that they were able to make bricks. And it was kind of an ingenious thing at the time, so they built. What did they build? Man is always trying to reach God. I've told you all this many times. Every religion in the world tries to tell you how to reach God. Christianity is the only religion, and I hate to call it a religion, where man has no ability to reach God. God had to reach man. So God, in the flesh, Jesus Christ came to do what man could not do, which is what God requires. That's the beginning of the gospel. We can't, he can. Jesus did it. I mean, that's all there is. It's done. He's done it all. There's nothing you can do for salvation. And too often, too often, we preach the gospel like this. Got to be good. Got to be good. If you're good, you're saved. No one's good but God. That's ex- I, 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 that is what Jesus Christ utters. No one's good but God. God demands perfection. God demands perfection. I'm, I'm sorry, people. You cannot be perfect. So that's why we put our faith in Jesus Christ, the one perfect man. The one perfect man. So we have the Tower of Babel. Man is always trying to reach. God confuses them. Remember, they had one language, so God disperses them, and they have all kinds of different language. Babel. You ever wonder where we get the term babbling? Oh, listen to that baby Babel. That's Genesis 11. That's from, that's from the Bible. They're babbling. It's kind of a, 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 a way man is not able to fully communicate. So the theme of Genesis... 1 through 11 is, uh, is man takes God's good gifts and corrupts them. You know, I, I mean, I can name so many. God gives us wealth, and what does man do? We turn it into greed. God gives us food, and what do we do? I mean, we overeat, you know? We turn it into glutton. It's just man constantly takes the good gifts of God and contaminates them. So, you know, that we, we just got to realize that. God gives us knowledge. He really, I mean, it's a gift from God. I'm so thankful somebody had the knowledge to build an air conditioning system that I can install in my house. And I wish it would work. That's probably knowledge on my end. <laughs> but that's a gift of God. An ape could not build an HVAC system. I mean, he can barely rub two sticks together. Can I get amen? <laughs> so, I'm getting silly. But that's really, that's what it is. Man is an image bearer of God. So what happens in Genesis 12? I meant to look at the, okay, we got time. Genesis 12, who comes on the scene? Abraham, who said that? Abraham, thank you, Sharon. So, 12, Abraham comes on the scene. And what does God say to Abraham? I love it. I will make you a great nation. And he says it really repeatedly. Let me just read you a few. Genesis 12 and verse 3. I will bless thee who bless you, and, I will, and him who dishonors you I will curse, and you and all the families of the earth shall be blessed. So he's telling Abraham and Sarah. Abraham's probably around 75 right now. 
They're barren. Sarah's barren. And God is saying, I will bless you. I will bless you and your family. I mean, he doesn't have a family. Genesis 17 and verse 7. And I will establish my covenant, my promise. I will establish my covenant between me and you, Abraham, and your offspring after you throughout this generation for an everlasting covenant to be God to you and your offspring after you. So he's already promised him a son. Now, I, I know Abraham's scratching his head, and we know what Sarah did with, 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 with Hagar. And, you know, he, she was trying to help God, and, and God doesn't need help. Genesis 22, verse, starting in verse 16, and said, By myself I have sworn. That's God. God can only swear to himself. There's nothing higher. Declares the Lord, because you have done this and have not withheld your son. Remember when he went, took Isaac up to offer him? Your only son, I will surely bless you. And surely multiply your offspring as the stars of heaven and as the sands that are on the seashore. And your offspring shall possess the gates of his enemy. And in your offspring shall be all nations of the earth be blessed because you have been obeyed. You, you have obeyed my voice. So we will see in the millennium. Remember we talked about the millennium. We will see this covenant come into a full fruition. Now, God is blessing Israel, and he's watching over Israel, and sometimes it's hard for the Jews, but we know that they will always persevere. It's a fact. They will always persevere. So, in the millennium, all, all the nations, we will become one nation as God intended, worshiping God. Now, notice this. I, I just want to go down a little rabbit trail real quick. Notice in Genesis 17, I'm backing up a little bit, God says, you shall be circumcised in the flesh of your foreskin, and it shall be a sign of the covenant between me and you. Do you know how sacred circumcision is to the Jew? It's everything. It is such a sacred thing that they, even to this day, it is sacred. Hitler during the 30s, 1930s, you know, a lot of times when they suspected someone of a Jew, that they were a Jew, do you know what they did if they weren't sure? Yeah. It was that repulsive to Hitler, to the Nazis, that it, it, was, it, 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 it would get them killed all, quite often. It would get them qu qu killed quite often. So circumcision is something that, all throughout the Old Testament. It is, it is a strong, strong uh, covenant, and it's a strong ritual for them. Again, even to this day. Now, now, now think about that. Now, fast forward to Galatians. Fast forward to Galatians. And Paul says, a Jew of the Pharisee, Paul says, if you're circumcised, then Christ is of no value. Meaning, you're not saved. You are going to hell if you get circumcised and think that's going to save you. Now, you might ask, well, was it Timothy, Mom, or Titus that got circumcised? That Paul actually had circumcised. I think it was Titus that Paul had circumcised. Now, why did Paul do that? Because he knew that it was important for he and, I think it's Titus, it may have been Timothy, but Titus, to go to the synagogue, he needed to be circumcised. So Titus wasn't getting circumcised to get salvation. He was getting circumcised so that he could preach to the Jews more effectively, so that he could win souls. So don't ever let anybody stump you up with that. Well, how come Titus got circumcised? And then, you know, again, Paul was trying to tell those Jewish, those Messianic Jews, that Jews who wanted to be a Christian, they were saying, hey, you've got to, you've got to jump into Judaism and then Christianity. And Paul was going, no, no. And why was Paul saying no? Because you getting into heaven, you getting saved is not an act you do. Think about that. You do nothing. Jesus Christ has done it all. All you have to do is put your faith and trust in Jesus Christ. So that's very important when we get to Genesis 12. 
that, that wait a minute, I got just a few more scriptures and I'm closing, I promise. So, huh, Timothy, sorry, I was wrong. So Timothy got circumcised. So Ephesians 2, I hope you all know this one. I'll start in verse 5. Even when you, this is Paul talking to the uh, what, uh, Ephesians, to uh, Ephesus. Even when you were dead in your sins, dead, hath quickened us together with Christ. By grace ye are saved. So how were the Old Testament saints, the Old Testament believers, saved in the Old Testament? By grace through faith. The same way you as a New Testament, a New Covenant believer are saved. Ephesians 2 verse 8, For by grace are ye saved through faith. But wait a minute, they had so much to do under the Mosaic law. They did. They had a, a ritual. That was only to show them they were sinners. So once a year, Yom Kippur, in the fall, they head up to the temple to make a sacrifice. They knew that the blood of bull and goats did not take away their sin. They knew it was temporary. They knew God was sending a Savior. Listen, we look back. They just looked ahead. But we're both looking at who? Jesus Christ. That's the only difference. The Old Testament was saved exactly the same way the New Testament. By grace. So when someone says, how do you get saved? You say, by grace through faith. That's how you get saved. By grace. God's good. It's nothing I do. It's all Jesus Christ. It's all Jesus Christ. Goodness is not the gospel. Write that down. Goodness is not the gospel. Morality is not the gospel. Is goodness good? Yes. Is morality good? Yes. It's not the gospel. You're a sinner. You need a Savior. And that's where Jesus Christ comes in. I repent and I follow him. Amen. Thank you, Bill. That's the gospel. That is the... It's that simple. I say that simple. <laughs> it, it is. It's that simple. By grace have I been saved. Well, how do you know that, Pastor? Hebrews 11. We all know <laughs> the, 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 the chapter of faith, Paul writes. Now, verse 1, Hebrews 11. Now, faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. For by it the elders obtained a good report. Verse 3. Through faith we understand that the world that the worlds were formed by the word of God, so that the things which are seen are not made of the things which do, which do not appear. And jump down to Hebrews 8 in verse 11, in chapter 11. By faith Abraham, when he was called to go to that place, which he showed after receiving for an inheritance, obeyed and went out, not knowing whether he went. By faith he sojourned in the promised land. Why did Abraham, why did God call Abraham? What did Abraham do for God to say, oh, you called my eye, Abraham? I tripped myself. What did Abraham do? He didn't do a thing. God just says, Abraham, you're the guy. Hey, hey, Abraham. I can't whistle. Woo! Go over to this land. And Abraham went. One could almost call him foolish. But that's faith. That's faith. To do what God has said. And we, and we can't see that clear picture. Remember when Jesus healed the, the, the blind man and it was all fuzzy at first? That's kind of a picture of the Old Testament. I mean, we didn't see that picture clearly. You and I do. We can look back and we clearly know Jesus Christ is the one, the, the, the perfect lamb. They looked ahead going, I know he's going to send a Messiah. I know he's going to send a Messiah, but he's a mighty king. So it was really hard for them to accept Jesus, this servant. But it was there in the Old Testament. It was there. They just had, you know, that, that, that they just preached more than others. They should have been preaching the whole council in the Old Testament, and they would have known. And then Romans 4. Romans 4. Paul, will, again, starting in verse 1. What shall ye say then that Abraham our father, as pertaining to the flesh, 
hath found. For if Abraham were justified by works, he hath whereof to glory. If Abraham did something for himself, he should be getting the praise, but not before God. For what saith the Scripture? Abraham believed God, and it was counted unto him as righteousness. So before he even took Isaac on Mount Zion, Mount Moriah, and sacrificed him, God counted it as righteousness. But why did he count it as righteousness? God is outside of time. He was already, he was given Abraham the credit for what Jesus Christ would do for him a couple thousand years later. Just like I'm given credit, or David, I can't remember, remember how we use that. I, it's, it's accredited to me. The same thing. Jesus Christ has paid for all my sin, past, present, and future. It's kind of hard to wrap your mind around, but it's, an e it's easy to say, and that's exactly what it is. Jesus Christ has paid. He is the propitiation. How about that for a big word? He's our propitiation. They use that a lot in the old, back in the old days to, to stamp on something to say, that loan is paid for. Boop, propitiation. Boop, propitiation. Jesus Christ paid our sin debt. He took my sin, and I got his righteousness. Woo! Yeah, that's pretty awesome, isn't it? I got something for nothing. He took my sin and gave me his righteousness. I mean... Come on, Bill, give me a whoo. I mean, uh, guys, guys, come on. You are sitting here, can't wait for what we talked about this past couple of Sundays, the, the end times, the, 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 the millennium, that awesome time to live when Satan's bound up because Jesus Christ did it all for you. I mean, I love you guys. I think you're pretty awesome, but you did not deserve it. I'm saying, neither did I, but Christ. Man, talk about love. Woo! My wife ain't ever done nothing like that for me. You know? And I've never, <laughs> I mean, it's reciprocated. Christ fully counted me as sinless. And he took my sin. Woo! That was a, that was a dump truck load of sin. I can, I can assure you of that. But Christ took it. Christ took it. So it's very important, very important that you remember, that you remember you've done nothing to deserve the salvation that you're given through Jesus Christ. It is by, that's why I wear these, Ephesians 2, it's for by grace you have been saved through faith. So don't ever get nervous. If somebody says, well, how do you get saved? Just, just put your fist down on whenever... By grace through faith. That's how you get saved. Ephesians 2, 8. You're saved by grace. By grace. It's so important. Amazing. Don't, don't get me singing, but I love amazing grace. So, Bua, if you would come up, we're going to sing the imitation song. But remember, Adam and Eve failed. Cain and Abel, there, there was a failure there. There is failure. Noah ended up failing. Abraham ended up failing. Remember, remember the kings were saying, is this your wife, Sarah? He said, no, it's my sister. I mean, Abraham failed. Abraham failed. Joseph failed. Everyone fails. King David, ooh, he failed miserably, did he not? That's why the only awesome person in the Bible is who? That's right. Amen. I love it. I love it. Jesus Christ is the hero. We don't study Goliath because it, it, what does it mean to you? Hey, it means I'm a sinner deserving of hell, and Jesus Christ paid it all. He defeated my sin like little David popping Goliath and killing him right then. That's exactly what Jesus Christ did with my sin. I just handed it to him. Here you go. And guess what he gave me in return? Woo! Righteousness. Righteousness. I better calm down. Boo, if you would, let's, uh, let's sing that invitation. By grace, through faith. Page 480 as we all stand. <laughs>
must surely give you the words that ten years grow. Only trust in only trust in only trust in Trust Him, only trust Him, only trust Him, Lord. He will save you, He will save you, He will save you now. Amen. Thank you. I promise, guys, next week I will get through Genesis and we will start. We will start. Um, Exodus. Exodus. Thank you, Bill. <laughs> Exodus. Yes, we will start Exodus. And I really think you'll be blessed. But the application, same as, same as last week, guys. I mean, we've done nothing. It is truly a gift. Now, in my house, if you give us a gift at Christmas, we will give you a gift. We have some gifts wrapped with no name so we can give. L listen, guys, Christ gave you something and wants nothing except your faithfulness. It is a true gift. You don't have to be good. You do, though. You don't have to be moral. You do, though. And Christ gives that to you by grace through faith. Just do not forget that, okay? Do not forget that. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we do thank you for that amazing and wonderful gift. We thank you for Jesus Christ, Lord. We have done nothing to deserve it, but Lord, he has given us everything. May that fill us with a joy, a hope, and a love so that we tell this lost and dying world that the only answer is Jesus Christ. Lord, we thank you, we praise you, and we give you all the glory, and it's in Christ's name I do pray. Amen.